Today I want to share with you how to make hardtack. This is an 18th century bread recipe that you may also know as ship's biscuit. But whatever you call it, this is a shelf-stable forever food that's perfect for storing in your extended or prepper pantry. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now hardtack, as the name implies, is a very hard piece of bread or you may even think of it like a cracker. But the good news is it basically has an unlimited shelf life. So it makes a very good food to make and then store in what we often call our prepper pantry or our survival pantry. Now it's not the type of piece of bread or cracker that you're gonna just bite into. Basically, it's so dried out, which helps preserve its shelf life, that when you do get ready to eat it, you're going to want to dip it in some type of liquid, which was normally how people in previous generations ate it. It wasn't uncommon for hardtack to be dipped in, into coffee or tea or smashed up and maybe mixed with a little brown sugar and a little hot water and made into a little bit of a sweet treat. But whatever way you decide to eat it, the nice thing is to know that you have something in your prepper pantry that basically is a forever food and can provide you at least some nutrition, something to fill your belly in a situation where maybe other food would be very limited or scarce. And if you're wondering why hardtack is sometimes referred to as ship's biscuits, as I mentioned in the beginning, is because going back to the 18th century, hardtack was often stored in big barrels and put onto ships. And this way, if the sailors ran out of food, they knew they had their hardtack and they knew that it would not go bad. So when they needed something to sustain them, they had their hardtack or ship's biscuit, which they could dip in some sort of liquid and give, them some, give themselves some nourishment. Well, let's get started making our hardtack. The first thing that you're going to want to do is preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, you're going to need some sort of baking sheet, or if you have one of those baking stones, all the better. That works beautifully when making hardtack. But since most people have a baking sheet, I'm going to use a baking sheet today. And then I like to put a piece of parchment paper on top of my baking sheet, but you don't need to do that. You can put your hardtack right onto your baking sheet. Now, a few tools that'll come in handy when you're making hardtack are a ruler and a pizza cutter or some type of sharp knife and a fork or a chopstick. And basically the fork and the chopstick are gonna be for making uh, little indentations into our hardtack so that it, it cooks and dries evenly. Uh, when, if you read uh, old fashioned recipes, they'll often say use a nail. <laughs> so I guess you can always use a nail in a pinch. Just make sure it's clean. Now to make hardtack, you just need three ingredients. And basically two ingredients, the water is the third one. Now I'll have a link in the description underneath this video, so just open up the description, look for the word recipe, there'll be a link there, and that'll take you over to the printable recipe, or you can always read it online, where I'll have the, the ingredients aren't very much, but I'll have all the directions there. Now when you make hardtack, it's a three to one ratio. So you can make as much or as little as you want. But what you wanna make sure is that you have three parts flour and one part water. So I'm gonna do three cups of flour and all I'm using here is a plain all-purpose flour. Now, can you use a whole grain flour? Yes, however, if you decide to use a whole grain flour, you're, you're going to decrease the shelf life of your hardtack because uh, the whole grain flour has oil in it and so that decreases the shelf life. The oil is more inclined to go rancid. Now this is just the basic all-purpose flour that you can usually see at the grocery store that is made from uh, wheat, modern day wheat flour that's had the bran, the germ all sifted out of it. 
If you've already started incorporating ancient grains into your kitchen and maybe you're using the all-purpose version, oh, that's my oven. I just, it just came up to 350 Fahrenheit. But if you've been incorporating whole grains into your kitchen, but, or the ancient whole grains, but you've started with the all-purpose version of the ancient whole grains so that you have all-purpose einkorn flour or all-purpose spelt flour, you can definitely use those as well in place of just the basic all-purpose flour that's made from modern day wheat. But the most important thing to remember when making a hardtack that you want to have a very long shelf life is that you use an all-purpose flour, whether it's the basic all-purpose flour that you can buy at your grocery store or one of the ancient grain all-purpose flours like einkorn all-purpose flour or, uh, or spelt all-purpose flour. But the nice thing is if you've already started incorporating einkorn or all-purpose flour or spelt all-purpose flour into your kitchen is that even though they have the bran, the germ, germ basically sifted out of them, what is left behind in its all-purpose form is actually richer in vitamins and minerals than modern-day uh, all-purpose flour. So making hardtack from uh, all-purpose einkorn or all-purpose spelt flour is a good idea. Next, to your all-purpose flour, you want to go ahead and add in two teaspoons of salt. And this is just a fine ground salt. And then you want to take your fork, spatula, wooden spoon, whatever you have. You can even use a whisk if you want to be fancy. And you just want to make sure that you mix the salt very well with your flour so that the salt is well distributed. Next, what you want to do once you mix the salt and the flour together is just make a little well, push the flour up to the sides best you can, and just make a little well in the middle. Then go ahead and get your water. We're just going to use one cup of water because we've used three cups of all-purpose flour. And remember the ratio is always three to one. And then go ahead and just pour all your water right in the middle of your bowl. Then you want to take your fork or your wooden spoon, whatever you're using, and you just want to start pulling your flour into your water so that you begin to mix everything up into a nice dough. Then after you work all the water into your flour and it looks like all the water has been absorbed, you're just going to have this real shaggy looking, <laughs> uh, shredded kind of looking mixture. And that's perfect. Now what you want to do is just clean off whatever you've been using, your fork or your um, <laughs> wooden spoon or spatula, whatever you've been mixing with. And now you can get in here with clean hands and just start to bring this into a bowl. You just want to bring it into a nice bowl of dough. Now we're going to set our bowl aside and all we're going to do is knead this a little, almost like you were making bread. Uh, but it's not as, you know, you don't need to do this for 10 minutes or anything like that. Just about a minute until you feel that it's really come together nicely and is in a nice soft, uh, it's become a nice soft uh, ball of dough. Now as I'm giving this this little bit of knead, kneading, my dough is not sticking to my board, but if you find your dough is sticking to the board, no problem. Simply take a little flour and dust your board and just continue on. Now after you knead this for about a minute, you want to get a rolling pin, or if you want, you can also use your hand to just flatten it. But this is where the ruler comes in handy. Certainly you can eyeball it, but basically what you want to do is flatten this out into a half inch piece of dough. Now as I'm rolling this out, I'm just periodically picking it up to make sure it's not sticking to my board, and I'm doing my best to try to get it into a square or a rectangle, something like that. But it really doesn't matter. You can have this in any shape that you want. Well, I've got this into about my half inch rectangle. And now, if you want, you have a couple of choices. You can take this whole thing and put it right onto your baking sheet or your baking stone and bake it whole like this. And it wasn't uncommon for it to be done this way in the 18th century. And sometimes a, a soldier or a sailor would be given this whole biscuit and that would basically have to sustain him for the day. But I think it might be a nice idea to divide this into crackers, like maybe more the size of saltines. 
You could also just cut it lengthwise once and uh, crosswise once and have four nice size uh, crackers or hardtack. But I think I'm just going to kind of eyeball this and I'm just going to cut this into nine crackers. And this pizza cutter works like a charm for doing this, but a sharp knife would work as well, would work well too. Now that I've got my dough cut into nine pieces, what we need to do is take some type of object. I'm gonna use a chopstick, you can use a fork, or as I said in the old fashioned recipes, they'll often, often say use a nail. But what you wanna do is put enough little indentations into your cracker, or your cracker to be, I think of these as crackers, into your hardtack to be, and you want to go all the ways through. And the reason is you want your, your hardtack to cook thoroughly and you want it to dry out thoroughly. And, you, and making these little indentations will allow it to do that, to both cook thoroughly and dry out thoroughly. Well, I've made little holes on all my pieces of dough and now all we need to do is transfer these to our baking sheet or baking stone if you have one of those. Now you may be wondering, can you make thinner pieces of hardtack that will bake up and uh, firm up, <laughs> become hardtack faster? And yes, you can. However, traditionally hardtack was made uh, a little thicker because it was made to be more of a substantial piece of food. So I want to try to do this as in a traditional way as possible. Now we're gonna bake our dough for 30 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit in our preheated oven on the middle rack. Well, I had these in the oven for the 30 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and now we're gonna to wanna to let them cool completely. And that's probably gonna take about 20 minutes. Then, after 20 minutes, we're gonna put them back into the oven, again at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, but this time we're going to leave them in the oven for one hour. And the reason we do this double bake with a cooling in the middle is because as the steam comes out of these, they start to dry out and they start to harden. And then when they go back into the oven for their second bake, they're really going to start to harden up. After the second bake in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour, what we're going to do at that point is we're not going to open the oven door, but we're going to turn the oven off. With the oven door closed and your hardtack still in the oven and the oven turned off, the temperature in your oven is going to start to come down slowly. As the temperature in your oven comes down slowly, it will continue to dry out your hardtack. And once your oven is completely cool, this may take a good couple of hours, and then you remove your hard tack. It's going to be very hard. Now some historical recipes may call for doing even more baking time. They'll not only do the first 30 minutes and let them cool and then put them back in the oven for another hour. They may then take them out again, let them cool, put them back in for another hour and so on and so forth. Maybe often up to even four bakes. But I think our two bakes are 30 minute and then our cooling time and then our one hour additional bake and then leaving them in the oven with the door closed but the oven turned off after that second one hour bake seems to be sufficient to get these to be nice and hard. So I'll continue to let these cool and once they've cooled down completely, I'll put them back in our 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for one hour. Then once the oven's all cooled, we'll take them out. I'll show you the best way to store them for your extended or prepper pantry and we'll also give one a taste, but we're not gonna be ju but just biting into it because it's gonna be really hard. But I'll show you how maybe the people in the 18th century ate them. Now, when I turned the oven off, leaving the hardtack in the oven with the door closed, it was seven o'clock at night. So what I decided to do was since the oven was off, I would just leave my hardtack in the oven overnight as the oven cooled down slowly. When I got up in the morning, my oven was completely cool and I took the hard tack out and this is what we have now. 
They're a lovely golden brown. They have a lovely aroma like a cracker or a bread, but they are as hard as rocks. And I mean, you're just not going to break these. And I'm not going to chance trying to bite into it and break a tooth. So what I'll do is I'm going to make a cup of coffee and we'll try dipping this in the hot coffee and then tasting it because that's similar to how it would have been eaten back in the day when they were regularly making these. So I've got the coffee brewing and I just wanted to share with you that, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, these were often called ship's biscuits because they were carried on ships by sailors and they were also eaten by soldiers because this was something that, as we've learned, is very shelf stable when it's baked to such a hard consistency like this. Sometimes what the sailors and soldiers would do, in addition to dipping them uh, into a warm beverage, maybe sometimes they'd also be dipping them into whiskey and things like that. But uh, the other way that they would often uh, make you know, or eat this would be to put it in a little sack and break it up and then mix it with water and cook it and make like a little bit of a mush. Or uh, other ways, they, if they had a little bit of sugar, uh, a little brown sugar maybe, they would uh, mix it with a little water and brown sugar and cook it that way and make themselves a nice little uh, sweet treat. Now when you're ready to store these, you can just go ahead and get a jar. I've just got a quart size jar here. I don't know if I'll be able to fit all of them in here, but you can go ahead and just put these right into a jar. You can also, I didn't do it this time, I just cut them up, but you can also use like a little biscuit cutter and make them all round. They'd go into a, a storage jar beautifully then. But once you get in your jar, you know, whatever size it is and how many that you can get in, you can just go ahead and put your lid right on. Uh, I'm using a canning jar, so if you have the canning lid and the canning ring, you can use that. This is just a typical storage lid that's often sold for canning jars, but I think they fit, you know, a, a typical quart size jar. And then if you want, a bowl, the people who make the canning jars have come out with these leak-proof airtight lids, which are terrific. And you can go ahead and use that. And now, this is ready for your extended pantry. And since it does have such an extended shelf life, uh, not only can it be in your extended uh, pantry, or prepper pantry as we call it, this really starts to come into the category of being a survival food for your survival pantry. And if you've not had a chance to download my pantry list, which is 36 pages and it's totally free, and it tells you how to go about stocking your pantry, and when I use the term pantry, I'm referring to the broad term of the Four Corners Pantry, your working pantry, which is usually your main pantry in your kitchen that you access on a regular or daily basis, your refrigerator, your freezer, and then your extended or prepper pantry or survival pantry in some cases. And that pantry list walks you through all the different foods you need to stock your traditional foods pantry. So it's especially helpful if you're at the beginning of your journey moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen and you want to know how to start replacing those processed foods for more traditional foods that you can stock in your Four Corners pantry. So I'll put a link below. Uh, just open the description under this video and I'll put a link below where you can uh, download that list. I think you'll find it very helpful. Now, realistically speaking, how long can these ship's biscuits or hardtack really last? And the answer is actually pretty long. The secret is going to be keeping them uh, dry and uh, in a sealed container away from bugs. That was the one problem they had uh, with the ship's biscuits that they would store in barrels. Sometimes bugs would get in there because they weren't sealed tight enough and then they would uh, enjoy the, the ship's biscuits or hardtack. But if you put them in some type of jar with an airtight lid or you have other ways that you like to store things, I have a video where I walk you through all the different ways uh, and all the different storage containers that are available for storing food long term. I'll be sure to link to that in the uh, iCards and in the description below. Uh, but yes, if you can seal the, if you can store these well, they can actually last you a very long time. And in difficult situations, and hopefully we never face them, uh, but they would come very, come in very handy as a backup or survival food. 
Now I want to mention, if you want to learn more about hardtack or ship's biscuits, be sure to check out two other YouTube channels. One is Townsend and one is Prep Stetters. They both have great videos on making hardtack and Townsend gives you a lot of history about hardtack. So I'll be sure to link to both of their videos in the description below. Well, I've got my coffee here with a little creamer in it. And uh, for those of you who have asked me, yes, I will be sure to put the link in the description below to uh, the video and printable recipe where I show you how to make my uh, healthy powdered homemade creamer that is shelf stable. So I know for some of you who may not have been able to find it and you were sending me emails about it, I will definitely be sure to put that uh, in the description below because it's much healthier than what you can buy at the store. But in any event, let's go ahead and start dipping this and see if we can get this to the point where it's not just palatable, but that I can break this with my tooth without breaking my tooth. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah. Mm. That's not bad at all. And coffee softened it up quite beautifully. You know, all things considered, this is pretty satisfying. Now, if you'd like to learn how to make more shelf-stable pantry staples to stock your rubber pantry, including make-ahead baking mixes and a cream of soup mix and the coffee creamer mix I talked about and more, be sure to click on this video over here and I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.